oh, it's April Fool's Day. And, oh boy, am I going to pull a prank on you guys. That, <laughs> that's right. I'm going to cover 10 horror movie spoof films. That's right. The joke's on you guys. <laughs> yep. <laughs> joke's on you suckers. <laughs> yep, I'm sure that you feel really foolish now, don't you? <laughs> I'm gonna die, aren't I? Number 10. We're starting this back in 2010 with Vampires Suck, mainly because it's a Twilight parody. And I've already, already done a couple of those, like, like Breaking Wind and Taint Light for other videos. And I don't know Twilight that well, and so I guess I just want to get this out of the way. Uh, it, it starts with Sparkles and, for some reason, Jello wrestling, although I'm, I'm pretty sure... We all know the reason. Um, Chang is here, and we flash back to Becca moving to a new town with her dad, Oswald Lee Harvey. Um, the, the jokes come fast and, I guess, furious, and mostly revolve around people getting punched, which is just hilarious. And, and it's enough that I honestly think that the whole writing process of this one was just them sitting around and going, well, in Twilight, she was walking down the hall, but we need to make it funny. Um, I've got it. She still walks down the hall, except in our version, she gets punched. Um, either that or they just throw in a random reference like, oh, look, it's the Jersey Shore people. We, we don't have a joke about them. The joke is just that they're here, I guess. Becca falls for pale, dreamy Edward Sullen. And he's a vampire. And there's some more villainous vamps around. And what's sad is that Dom DeLuise died a while ago. But his legacy lives on with his son, uh, David DeLuise, who uh, yeah, does, doesn't quite have his dad's magic touch with comedy. Uh, of course, there's a love triangle with brooding Jacob. And if you're wondering just how it's possible that this movie is so unfunny, you should know that it's from the team of Friedberg and Seltzer the duo who had previously brought you Date Movie, Epic Movie, and Disaster Movie. So it's a surprise that they didn't just roll with calling this one Vampire Movie. Unlike most of their films which jump around from movie parody to movie parody, they managed to stick to just doing Twilight, but then surrounding it with what they're calling jokes. I'm not calling them that. They are. I actually remember the weekend that this movie came out and I went to the theaters and there was a couple in line before me to buy tickets and they said, two for vampires suck, please. And man, I just judged them so hard for their movie choices. 10 seconds before purchasing my ticket for Piranha 3D. I, I guess a lot of people needed judging because this sucker made 81 million bucks at the box office. So I guess I should point out that Piranha 3D made 83 so haha <laughs> there suck it vampire sucks number nine next up on my torture parade we're going to 2013's a haunted house which was billed as a parody of paranormal activity and the marketing was made to ape theirs it has everyone's favorite weigh-ins brother marlin it opens found footage style as Malcolm has bought a new video camera and is recording his daily life and is done just like the PA opening, except with gut-busting dog getting run over action. And his girlfriend Keisha is moving in with him and of course, for whatever reason, they set up a camera to record themselves sleeping. And like, the, the original movie didn't have that plot conceit until they already suspected that supernatural stuff was going on. But here they're just, I guess, filming for the hell of it so anyway if you're like a beginning comedy writer like this this is the first comedy you've ever written uh everyone out there play along what's the most basic and obvious thing that you would think to have happen here that would take no effort whatsoever to write David Ketchner shows up, and I, I like him. He's usually pretty funny when he has funny material, which here he does not. In fact, most of his jokes revolve around him wanting to say the N-word. Just non-stop hilarity. 
And then Andy Daly is here and all of his jokes evolve around wanting to see his wife having sex with black men. And are, are you seeing a theme here? I guess I should point out that this is almost a half an hour in and there hasn't even been a hint of anything supernatural yet. And honestly, not even a hint of humor yet. But maybe that's just me and my ridiculous requirement for comedy to involve actual jokes. Nick Swartzton also shows up because when you're having trouble writing comedy, you call on the star of Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star. Uh, can you guess what his jokes are? He's gay and wants to have sex with Malcolm. And that, that's the entire joke. I'm not going to make it through this episode alive, am I? And this much comedy is from Michael Titties. And if I was operating on the comedy level of this movie, I would point out that his name is Titties. And this was his first feature film. And I guess he's somehow connected to Marlon Wayans because he's in literally all of his movies. And this does follow the plot of Paranormal Activity somewhat closely, except with Cedric the Exorcist-Tainer. It, it's just... I mean, this, this is just sheer torture for me. And this made like $60 million at the box office. So they made a sequel. But thankfully, I don't have to watch that one. Number 8. This next one is from 2009, and it's Stan Helsing, which was billed as a parody of Van Helsing, which had come out just a few years before. We're introduced to Stan Helsing, who works at a video store, and then it's rapid-fire, I guess, jokes, uh, featuring vague racism, random half-naked women, and poop, and farts, letting me know that I have entered the fifth circle of hell. Stan and his friends are headed to a Halloween party, and... Half of the employees of Good Burger are there, as is Diora's Bairds. And holy crap, the, the, the Daily Show lady. Turns out that Stan is being sought by this... Oh look, it's Pinhead. But instead of pins, it's darts and syringes. Um, get it? I don't either. But I guess it's funny because it's different sharp objects. There's also a Freddy, who I suppose is Freddy Flav and stoned Michael Myers... Oh, and a, a Chucky, and then a Leatherface. And, and along the way, they just encounter a bunch of weird situations like a psycho hitchhiker. Uh, he's told by someone that he's the spinning image of Van Helsing, the monster hunter. And yeah, in case you haven't noticed by now, this isn't exactly a direct parody of Van Helsing, and instead is a mishmash uh, of a bunch of different parodies. Uh, if the guys who did Date Movie and Epic Movie and all that were already here, didn't do like a like a horror movie, or I guess a scary movie. Um, well, I, I guess this feels more like their speed, since it's just essentially whatever horror reference they can throw on screen at any given time without any actual jokes. And again, just sort of saying, hey, look at this. Isn't this like that other thing? You know that other thing. Isn't it funny that it's here now? It tries for a bit of comedy cred by bringing in Leslie Nielsen, and this is one of his very last films, just one year before he died. And although I'm glad that he didn't go out on this one, his final film was yet another parody called Spanish Movie. For as much as this one feels like a Friedberg and Seltzer movie, it's not. And it's instead by Bo Zenga, and is actually the only movie he directed. He did do an episode of a TV show as well, but 12 years after this. And he was involved in writing for a handful of things, including... Soul Plane, but in terms of directing, he'd only done Dan Helsing, which actually did get released in theaters, but on a limited run and only brought in a million and a half. But since it was shot for less than 500k, it made a little bit of profit. It was so similar to the Scary Movie vibe that in China, this was released as Scary Movie 5. And I guess this is like 5% better than the other two I've covered right here, but it's still really, and, and pretend I said really 17 more times, not my sense of humor. Although there was one joke in particular that made me laugh. Yeah, I think that one girl was ambidextrous. Wow, I'd give my right arm to be ambidextrous. But yeah, this is staggeringly unfunny and really has no story as it's just a random assortment of encounters that these characters have and what? What, what did I do to myself? Number seven. Let's keep going with another take on the paranormal activity stuff with 2010's 
abnormal activity. This has a young couple named Roger and Stacy, and they're of course filming things for I guess no real reason, but they are. They hear noises at night and they decide to make a documentary about it, and on the first night they get Stacy sleeping in weird positions. But I guess they're saying it's proof of the supernatural. We're talking about how much people are going to be watching their documentary and is literally just a person twitching in their sleep. They do the PA thing by putting the baby powder on the floor, and one night they hear someone using their restroom. And instead of just freaking out and calling the cops because someone is in their house, they just hang out downstairs and film each other. Roger then antagonizes and taunts Stacy about it, and let me tell you, if you watched Paranormal Activity and were like, Mika is just such a jerky character and makes really dumb decisions. Well, this guy makes him look like, I don't know, a sane person? I suppose that since this is a spoof, that it's amplified in order to make it funnier, but, but there's really no jokes here. It's just kind of like, what if Paranormal Activity had an even more annoying main character? And that, that's what they ran with. I think that they thought if Roger was really mean to his girlfriend, that that would translate as comedy. But, oh, 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 let me tell you, it does not. Uh, take this for an example. Well, when you get your diaper changed, come on out. She's doing okay. exercises. <laughs> Look how oh. fat she is. <laughs> That's why she's got to do exercises. <laughs> funny, right? So, so funny. Uh, this is literally the entire first half hour of this movie. Just this guy being a dick. And then this demonologist character that I think is meant to be a stoner. Like, he just mumbles a lot and says, yeah, man. Uh, again, things that are not jokes. He tells them that his school bus crashed and exploded into their house back in the 40s. And oh my god, nothing happens. There's no real connections to paranormal activity, and it's not like they're directly spoofing specific moments, and it's more just a couple of people are redoing the general concept, and go figure. Roger is played by Jason Gerbe, who also wrote and directed it, as well as produced, edited, and did the music for it. But don't let that sound impressive, because if you saw it, you'd know it's not uh, i'm, I'm kind of guessing all the side characters are his friends because every single so-called paranormal expert that comes over is another dude that is right around the same age as him kind of like a welcoming the demon sees it it's gonna but mess not really just mess, mess i get it make friends with the demons you know see it's a comedy because people are acting weird and doing weird things they're not telling jokes or saying anything funny. They're just saying regular things in wacky ways. I, I'm not kidding that around 50 minutes, the big event that happens is that they leave a pizza out for the ghost and they come downstairs and someone has eaten two pieces. And this actually had two sequels, both of which were also directed by Gerbet and had the joke of skipping part two. So the sequels are parts three and four. And, and you know what? Uh, normally, I'd reserve my scorn for movies with a budget. I, I try to be kinder to backyard efforts and films that are clearly just some people making what they can with the resources that they have. And most of the movies on this list have actual money behind them. So I don't really want to be harsh with this one because it looks like I had a budget of what it cost to order that pizza. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can do it. Number six. Now let's head on back to 2000 for a little something called The Bogus Witch Project. And gee, wonder what this will be a parody of. And it's actually an anthology of several spoofs of Blair Witch. And the first segment is called The Watts Bitch Project. And they have a girl that actually looks quite a bit like Heather. And oh boy, they head into Watts. And if you're thinking that there's no way this movie is going to be stupidly racist in the first five minutes, um, yeah. You are wrong. They wander around Watts and every single person they meet is either a drug dealer or a pimp. And the whole gist of this is just like, what if instead of them getting lost in the woods, they get lost in the hood? And, and they follow the story of the original, except that they add in 
uh, jokes, but they don't actually, because the only joke is racism. Oh, and th then they do the whole I'm so sorry scene and make a booger joke because surely no one else has thought of doing that. There's then a skit that features several state members uh, that I've seen elsewhere that's actually pretty fun, but it has nothing to do with Blair Witch. There's then the Griffith Park Project with another crew, this time headed into Griffith Park. And Steve Ag is in this one, looking uh, quite different than he appears now. He's actually a, a pretty funny guy, but you kind of wouldn't tell from this segment, which is mostly just people arguing with each other. And, and I think that that's meant to be funny here. In between each segment, there's fake commercials, and they're, th those are actually pretty humorous and are probably the only laughs I got here. It wasn't that consistent because one of them was a trailer for a fake movie called A Stalking on M Elm Street, and, and the entire joke is that a woman is being stalked by Stephen Hawking. Get it? Because he's handicapped because of his degenerative disease that left him paralyzed and unable to talk. Isn't that hilarious? The next segment is called Polly Shore's The Bogus Witch Project. And if, and if you need any other indication of the level of comedy within, then I, I don't know what to say. Um, I guess this was put together by Victor Cargan, although it looks like this was the only thing he did in the industry. And this currently sits at a whopping 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. And, and, and what do you know? There's another segment that's also about a witch legend in the inner city. And, and this one may not be full of chock full of casual racism. No, instead it has to throw out blatant homophobia instead. And, and yeah, to go along with the fact that the vast majority of what's going on here uh, just is not funny, it's also repetitive as hell. It's short after short making fun of the same stuff, but not even really making fun of it, just doing it again, but in a different setting, with several making the same jokes. There's multiple gags of, you left the lens cap on. Maybe you should take the lens cap off. Help, 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 I can't see, help, help! Hey, Kubrick, might help if you take the lens cap yeah. off. And more than one time where the joke where the guy standing against the wall at the end is revealed to be taking a pee. And it just goes on and on and on. And, and you know what? Excuse me a second. <laughs> Number five. Let's hope that we can turn things around here since we're going to a more recent one with 2017's Re-Agitator Revenge of the Parody. It starts with Mr. Lobo introducing the whole thing and uh, talks about Dr. Orbert Westcraft. So you can bet that this is a reanimator spoof. It's got Schooly D as the president. And, and when Claudia here is sick and dying, her wealthy husband takes her to a doctor. And there's some pretty out there sequences. And her husband is played by Alan Merrill. And this guy was a massive songwriter who mostly wrote songs for other performers but also had some success himself. This is the guy who wrote, I love rock and roll. And he passed away back in 2020 from complications from COVID. She gets taken to Dr. Westcraft, who has a pretty familiar look. He declares that Claudia is dead, and claims that he's found the answer to eternal life. And this is all told in a very fragmented experimental format and a very, very loosely spoofs reanimator. And, is she, is she looking right at the camera? In this version, Westcraft was unable to save a former love and has constantly sought a way to defeat death to make up for it. And when Claudia dies, he injects her with his formula, which sets off a scene with several people dancing on a rooftop for some reason. It works and she's reanimated, but then escapes and heads out onto the street. And yeah, this is pretty different overall from the reanimator. And it's a little funny that it's billed as a parody when it's essentially just taking the very base root of Herbert West reanimator and then just going in a very different direction with it. And this one 
is from Dylan Mars Greenberg, who also directed the bizarre Amityville unofficial entry, Amityville Vanishing Point. And if that film was Amityville, but put through the lens of trying to ape David Lynch, this is Reanimator put through the lens of uh, trying to ape David Lynch. And it's distributed by Troma. So, of course, there's an appearance by Lloyd Kaufman. And here's the deal. Um, is this funny? Not really. Is this interesting? That depends. I, I like Greenberg. Their style of filmmaking is weird and probably not what you would categorize as good, but it's unique, creative, and takes some effort. Even if I don't always like what's going on, I always appreciate the energy that went into it. And yeah, for the first time since I started this list, I don't hate my life choices. Number four. Okay, I have a feeling that's not going to last because this next one is 2015's The Walking Deceased. And it starts with a zombie outbreak. And then it's 29 days later. Next, we have a handsome zombie in a red hoodie. So they're doing the warm bodies spoof. And the undead here are starting to slowly become human again. Uh, but people keep killing them. And clearly these two characters are meant to be a take on zombie land. But then a guy wakes up from a coma and has been there for the whole invasion, which is clearly a parody of 28 Days Later, right? Anyway, he puts on a sheriff outfit that looks really familiar, and this guy's no stranger to parodies, since this is Dave Sheridan, who played Doofy in Scary Movie. They do a take on the zombie little girl thing, but how's this for a joke? The sheriff just thinks everyone is a zombie and shoots them. And... I, I'm going to be honest, I, I have no clue if it's meant to be comedic. They all take cover in a mall, because of course they do, and there's a Daryl-type character. And I, I'll say this, they're at least trying to create some different type of humor and story. They're not just aping the scenes of these other zombie properties, but they're just kind of taking the, like, these character spoofs and putting them into their own situations. And most of the characters seem to be in a more reserved movie, except... For Sheridan, who acts like he's in an over-the-top Jim Carrey type thing and feels like he wandered in from some other film or something. And this was directed by Scott Dow and was his directorial debut. And he'd only do one other film after this that's not spoofy at all. But it was written by Tim Ogletree, who also plays Romeo, the warm bodies guy here. And he had earlier been in a different parody film called Supernatural Activity, which was written by Andrew Pazza who also appears in this one. And yeah, what's weird is that after a while, this one feels less like a spoof film and more like a fan film. And like, it's not as patently embarrassingly hard to get through as most of the other films here. It's just still not really my speed. Number three. Okay, I think my luck is about to go bad again because right now I'm checking out 2013's 30 Nights of Paranormal Activity with the Devil Inside the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Oh boy, yeah. There, there was uh, this short-lived thing with parody movies just having a string of different titles that they were spoofing. And I guess this is one. I knew exactly what I was in for when in the first two minutes of the movie, two women buy a storage unit and inside, for literally no reason at all, is Adele or a reasonable facsimile. No reason. She's just there for you to go, oh, I know Adele. Ha ha. There's then a mass murder, and this guy is on the scene, and this dude right here is the voice of the dog, Alvin Flang, from the film Love on a Leash. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, oh, good lord, I don't even know where to start with it. So I guess I'll save that for another day. Poor dog. We gotta give you a name. I already have a name. How about we call you Rover? I already have a name. My name is Alvin Fwang. Well, okay, maybe something's a little more class. Like Alvin Fwang. But yeah, uh, the, the murder is the cast of the artist. And again, th again, there's no joke there. It's just, wouldn't it be funny if the murder victims were the cast of the artist? That's the entire joke. French Stewart is here. And I'm only five minutes into this, and it's already the most painfully unfunny thing here. Um... I, I take it back. A Haunted House was worse. I, I don't know. Maybe a bogus witch project? N no, not that one. A Vampire Suck. Uh, no, wait. I, I'm back to a, a Haunted House. Uh, 
th this is almost as bad as that, but not quite. Um, our main girl is Dana here, and for no reason, she was on The Bachelor, and they got married and had a couple of kids. And, and they move into a new house. And I would say that moving is the greatest terror, but watching horror movie spoofs is by far the greatest terror. Well, they start having paranormal stuff happen, like the ghost writing on his face in Sharpie, which was a joke that they also told in A Haunted House because it was so funny that they had to repeat it, I guess. And they call in the Ghost Brothers, who are uh, uh, like a paranormal investigator show. And these two guys used a time-honored comedy tradition of just yelling everything really loud, which I personally find so very, very funny. Uh, and I suppose I should have known when I picked this one, since it's by the guy who directed Breaking Wind, a movie I had on a list of worst horror films of all time. And it rightly belonged there. It was a movie I didn't chuckle at once. Half of this one doesn't even make sense, like their neighbor is Abe Lincoln, and he's really horny. And I don't know if that's a reference, like, like is it because Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was out the year before this? So they were just like, we have to have Abe in this, even if it doesn't make sense or isn't a joke. And and yeah, can I can I just be serious for a second? Because I, I know in these videos, I sometimes exaggerate how hard it is to get through some of them. But I want you to know that this is not a joke. Uh, this is the worst thing I've ever done for this channel. Um, bad horror is one thing. Bad comedy. I hate every second of this. Number two. I guess now we're going to prove that this whole bad parody of horror film things uh, isn't exactly new. You go back to 1994 for The Silence of the Hams. Parody of... I mean, come on, come on. Do I, do I really need to say it? it? It at least got a chuckle from me in the opening. Why was I stabbed in the chest? And we're in Los Angeles and Sex Pest Eddie Deason is here. And then what? John Carpenter? And then Slam Evil is here. And remember when I said that I chuckled? Well, that might have been the limit, since Zane's character's name is Joe D. Foster. And he has that printed on his shirt, in case you didn't get the joke. Larry Storch is here, as is Kwato's host. And then uh, buckle up, because this movie has like 100 recognizable people. There's Proctor, and then not necessarily the news's finest anchor. And one of the Ewings. He goes to the house from House 2, the second story. And Erwin Keyes is here. Um, a member of Jump Street. Tony Cox. Vigo. And then we have our Hannibal substitute. Here called Animal Cannibal. And it's Dun 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 Captain Chaos. And here's the thing. This is Dom DeLuise. This guy can read the worst possible scripts and find the humor in them. And that's very obvious here, because these jokes aren't great. But you know what? They're jokes. This this movie actually does try some jokes, not just references and farts, although it does have those as well. But it's not solely relying on those. However, the jokes mostly fall flat, but at least Dom gives them some charm. But then the faces just keep on coming since Hightower is here too, and Phyllis Diller. And so is Rip Taylor, as Rip Taylor, doing what Rip Taylor does. But hey, look, even in the 90s dumb comedies, we're still like, oh, we can't think of a joke, so let's just hit someone. But then a woman who might also be an evil tree is here, and in the middle of a psycho parody, they bring in the actual Milton Arbogast, and then a sort of Norman Bates hotel attendant who's played by a guy named Ezio Gregio, and he's the writer and director of this film. And he's only made a few more films after this and made sure to cast himself in the lead in them. And then you know the guy who naked wrestled Borat? Well, here he is as Pavarotti. Then John Landis is here, so look for helicopters. And then Mel Brooks shows up. And then Gomez. And did, like, is he Gregio have, like, blackmail material on a bunch of people or just, like, a lot of money? How many people are in this? And And you know what? Overall... This isn't that painful. I mean, sure, it's bad. Uh, this is not a good comedy. But they are jokes, which is way more than I can say for some of these others. It's just dumb comedy. 
Like, prepare for your 1,000th gang about zombies where they suddenly do a thriller dance. But here's where the difference is. I feel like the later movies would just have Michael Jackson show up and do the thriller dance, and that would be the joke. It would just be like, remember Michael Jackson and the zombie thing? Well, here though, they do the dance, but it then it turns into a joke. Not a good one, but one. Oh, and they even throw in Shelley Winters at the ending? Uh, I I'm pretty sure I've even missed a few people that appeared here, but okay, this was tolerable. Why do I have a bad feeling about what's coming next? Number one. Oh, great. It's another Paranormal Activity spoof. But this one is from 2013, and it's called Paranormal um, Whacktivity. and begins with a masturbation gag. And, and, and we have Michael here, and he bought a new video camera and wants to make a sex tape with his girlfriend. And oh, great. Uh, a Borat joke. But it's not a joke, it's just a guy in the Borat swimsuit. So again, just a reference. Just look, he's wearing the same silly outfit that Borat did. Remember that? Thankfully, this isn't found footage style and is just told in narrative fashion and supernatural stuff starts to occur. And Michael is going to great length to set up the production for their saucy video. But then, the spirit in their house keeps interfering and they catch weird stuff on their night cam. This is exactly what my film needs. Comic relief. Is, is that what this is? They keep on trying, but the ghost keeps messing with them, so they seek some help, and a Ghostbuster shows up that says he's an Ernie Hudson impersonator. But I don't know. Have they even seen Ernie Hudson? Uh, is this just some sort of whatever, just use any black guy because white people won't be able to tell the difference? Like, why cast this guy and have him say he's an impersonator? Either cast someone that looks like Hudson, or maybe just change that line of dialogue when you don't. And they make the same exact joke of the demon slamming the door over and over and over again, but the people don't wake up that was in, I, I don't remember, one of these other movies. And, and if you want to know the level of comedy here... How can you expect me to be attracted to a man who can't even date rate me properly? I'm sorry. Oh boy, can't stop laughing at that one. When they realize that the ghost is obsessed with Casey, they have a party with a bunch of hot girls with the hopes that it'll find someone else to follow around, and... Please, when we first met, I thought he was the real Ernie Hudson. Oh, come on, lady! Are you blind? But wait, it's worse. There's a guy who is supposed to be the actual Tiger Woods, and this is him. And, and that convinces me. The casting team were just like, like, get me any black person. And then... In the interest of repeated jokes, in a haunted house, when our female lead was sleepwalking, there was a joke where she just started dancing. Well, this has that same gag, because there's only so many jokes that you can make with this stuff without trying. And oh yeah, no one here is doing that. So there you have it, 10 movies that... Wait, what? April Fool's? I have to watch one more? Come on, man. What are you doing to me? All right, please, just, stay, just take it easy on me. Number one, again. So it looks like our actual number one is from 2014, and it's, oh, come on! This picks up where the last one left off as Malcolm then leaves the house with a still-possessed Keisha, and they get into a car crash, and they think she's dead and run off. It's dead a year later, and he's now moving into yet another new house with his new girlfriend, and oh snap, it's Joy Turner. And she has a couple of kids, and Fluffy is here, and oh, hey, they find an Annabelle doll, so I'm sure they'll come up with a some sort of carefully crafted joke to come up with, and oh, uh, no, no, they're just going to have him have sex with it. Um, hilarious. And, and I should point out that this is again presented as found footage, but there's no commitment to it at all like the shots that seem like they're from a narrative perspective and there's no reason for anyone to be filming there's a sinister parody and do they have a joke or will someone just get hit yep someone just gets hit and, and then there's a joke where a kid is having a tea party with the ghost and it turns out that there's alcohol in their little cups 
which is a joke that was also in 30 nights of blah 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 and, and it's just crazy how many very obvious jokes are in these very obvious comedies and then there's this professor and he's also running a meth lab and oh man i wonder what this could be a reference to it's just so subtle i wish you good luck gotta get my breaking bad on Oh, thank you. If you didn't explain what was referencing, I would have had no clue. Thank you for explaining the joke. And, and then to really just put a cap on things, uh, this is said. When are they gonna stop making scary movies without the weigh-ins? They f***ing suck. Wow, I didn't realize that the house he's moving into at the beginning of the movie was made of glass. Maybe put that stone down, Marlon Wayans. Um, put it right down. Uh, and I guess I should point out that the first movie cost only $2.5 to make and brought in $60 million, so it's clear why this sequel was made. And, and the whole team was brought back, and it had a slightly higher cost of around $4 million and earned quite a bit less with a $25 million take, which is still a decent profit. And, and I guess because this was less tied down to making fun of only Paranormal Activity and instead takes that whole, we're going to make fun of a bunch of different horror flicks, it's a small improvement, uh, but it's still mind-numbingly awful. I didn't laugh a single time. Not once. But I guess it wasn't as patently as annoying as the first one. Like, if that one was 10 on an annoying scale, this one is a 9.78, which I know is not a huge improvement. But with this list, I'll take it. So there you have it. April Fools, don't you guys feel silly? Man, the egg is on your face. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, no, really, these were awful. Uh, I hated every single minute of this. Uh, there was only one or two of these movies that I kind of enjoyed. Everything else was pain. Pain. Uh, let me know if you think these are hilarious, and so I know that we have very different sense of humor. Tell me that in the comment down below. If you enjoyed this video and liked seeing me squirm, hit that like button, subscribe, go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines and help support this channel. Help me pay for my next therapy session. And yeah, keep coming back. I'll see you very shortly for another great video that hopefully does not make me want to kill myself.